what I miss. And we can tell that some of you are eager for us to get going. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> I'm going to start you off with a, uh, a nice EDM music video about Dave Bases, which you probably have seen before. And then we'll be going here in just a moment. Let's just sit back, chill, and we'll see you soon. And hello, everybody. Welcome today to our Jamstack Battlestacks workshop. I am David Jones Gilardi, joined by Kirsten Hunter. Hello, Kirsten. Hello. I just started at Data Science last month, and I just have to tell you how excited I am to share this technology with you. Awesome. No, this is not pre-recorded comps. Hi. That's what happens when you ask a live question and we see it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's totally live. <laughs> now, by the way, Kirsten, is it can everybody hear and see us okay and for some reason kirsten i on my I end know, my video seems i see you stuck. frozen let me see yeah you're frozen in skype and i'm not sure why but you are frozen in skype maybe try to stop and restart your video uh sure i will do that and uh, while we're waiting for kirsten to go ahead and do that uh janos um in youtube do we need to pre-install anything no not really we we provide all of um, everything that we're going to do today, we can do up and we will do up on cloud instances. Now, some of you, if you choose, there is a local option. Uh, we will be working like in an IDE and such. Now, if you do the local option, then you will have some things to install, but it usually doesn't take very long. Um, but we do really encourage everybody to use all the cloud stuff. We're, we, we set it up so you can just do it all online and we've preloaded a lot for you. And I heard you're back. Oh, you're back. Hey, Kirsten, yes, let's try that again. Woo! All right. There's... Kirsten wasn't just a cardboard cutout, right? She was actually a real person. And now you can see her. And hello, hello, hello. Oh, where's the link for the YouTube stream? Uh, Afnan, in Discord. Well, if at the very top in Discord of the main chat room, you'll see a YouTube link. That's the link to the stream itself. So if you just click that, that should bring you there. Um, I can also give it to you as well. If you give me just a second. Yes, and Hootie Tootie. Yes, this is uh, all of our workshops. We do record them live, and then they will be available um, right after the stream ends. So if there's anything, thank you, Chris. If there's anything that you need to watch after the fact or whatever, if you want to review some things, you can totally do that. Okay, so first things first, what I'd like to do is get in and ask all of you some questions before we get into the content. So if you would, um, you'll see on the screen this little floating ship, and you should see, boom, there it is. You see, she should see a QR code, and on the left-hand side, a URL for menti.com. Um, so we use Menti for a couple things. We use it for some of the interaction in our workshops. Um, one thing is I'm going to start by asking some of you some questions, and then we're going to quiz you along the way. And the top three winners of all of our quizzes today win swag, right? So this is important stuff. Um, so go to menti.com. The code is 912328, or just use your phone's camera and snap a picture of that QR code, and it should open right to where you are. And then when you do that, when you get in, I see some of you are already doing it. Exactly. Give us a thumbs up. Let us know that you're in there. And that way we'll have an idea that you're here with us and we'll give everybody a moment to get in. And again, this is both for some of the questions we're going to ask you in the beginning. We'd like to know a little bit more about you. It helps us tailor some of the things maybe we're going to address and say today. Uh, but then also, like I said, you get those swag quizzes, uh, which are really important. Okay. I see about 90 some odd folks in here. We're just topped a hundred. Wonderful. Give you another moment to do that. I got frozen again. So. Oh, did you get frozen again? Yeah. So no, I you just, look like you're moving okay. on my end. Okay. Yeah, I just um, I just restarted. The oh, okay. All right. Well, you know, this is always the fun with this stuff, right? Okay. So let's take a look. All right. We've got. All right. So we've got about two hundred of you, uh, two eighteen with you with with us right now. I'll go ahead and move into these questions, but you can get into the mentee at any time. All right. So the first question, which JavaScript developer are you? Uh, 
And that includes Node, right? Oh, totally. Yeah, this could be front end, back end. This is really more of it's not so much the language of the framework, but are you more of a front end JavaScript developer, back end, full stack? I see a bunch. I don't work with JavaScript. And by the way, um, in this question I've seen come up a couple times already. Um, if for what we're doing today, if you're not familiar with any of the languages, you are totally cool. Okay. Everything that we do, um, all the exercises, the information, the solutions will be provided for you. So even if you're not familiar with the language, um, no worries, you should be all right. Wow, it looks like that we have a pretty good spread of folks. Um, that is always fun to see. All right, thank you everybody for that. Let's go to the next question. And what experience do you have with Jamstack? This is always a fun one. I wondered, I wonder how many we're gonna be never heard about it, right? So, oh, I've got at least one who uses it all the time. Wonderful, and, and some folks who have used it a couple of times. And most of you, wow, it looks like most of you have never heard about it before. Okay. Well, good. You're going to learn about it today. Uh, I hope by the end of this workshop um, that you will have some newfound knowledge and be on your way to using Jamstack because Jamstack is actually seriously cool stuff. All right. So with that, what I'm going to do is keep your menti open. I'm just going to go to this next thing. Keep your menti open because as we go through the exercises, as we go through um, the material and we get into some of the quizzes, you're going to need this later right so just go ahead and leave that up now before we get into the content it probably helps if you see the game that we're talking about by the way kirsten are you still with us i see that you're frozen and you're you're probably I, doing that i am i keep i keep trying to restart it but um maybe i don't know uh let me try again okay it's very strange <laughs> fun with skype this is uh, what you didn't know. This, this is this. actually a Skype troubleshooting no. session. So if anyone can... <laughs> yeah, I, I have no idea what, what is causing it to be so unhappy. It says it's on, but it doesn't see me. Oh, maybe. Um, I wonder if maybe you need to restart Skype, actually, and come back to that same. Yeah. Link. Uh, OK, no problem. I'll be right okay. back. All right, cool. All right. Well, while Kirsten is doing that and while we're having some Skype fun there, um, uh, let me explain the game and what's going on here. So hopefully you all see my screens. Um, so Battlestacks, the game that we're working on today, right? Um, it's kind of similar to something like Apples to Apples, or you know, there's some card games out there that are kind of fun, um, where the whole goal is to kind of be, say, funnier or more provocative or something. It's almost like Mad Libs, where you're asked a set of questions and you fill in the blanks, right? And then the other people playing get to score those questions. That's what Battlestacks essentially is. Now, this has been implemented as a, as a full Jamstack application, right? So it's React Redux using um, Node, um, and it is actually deployed. This is deployed on Netlify in a global CDN. The whole pipeline uses GitHub CI CD actions, the, the whole kit and caboodle, right? Um, so this is a real app that's been deployed. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start it real quick just to give you a feel for what that looks like. So I've got a new game here. Here's my game code. That almost looks like plebe. <laughs> so here's plbe. I'm going to do this in each one. And let's join. I see Chris Kirsten has come back. Hello again. All right. Hello. Let's hope that your Skype continues to function properly. Yes, that would be excellent. OK, so let's go ahead and do this. There we go. OK, so what I'm going to do is start the game. Now, obviously, I am emulating or simulating that I'm playing as three different players. But in the real world, uh, you would have, you know, each each person would be would have their own uh, interface that they're looking at. You wouldn't see three at the same time. And then I'm going to be asked a set of questions. Let's see what gets better with age, uh, wine, title of the shortest book on Earth. Eh, right. You know, I mean, I don't know if these are particularly funny or not. So you can totally comment and um, you know, tease me or whatever. Uh, what is the next Happy Meal toy? Um, Harry Feet, All right? Let's see, this is your captain speaking. Fasten your seatbelts and prepare for 2021. That wasn't very funny. I'll that wasn't... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, let's see. What can I think of? Uh, plastic cups. Right. So then, <laughs> yeah, right. Everyone, everyone puts in their answers. Um, and then what's going to happen is. The players will each be asked to score them. Now, if you answered a particular question, you won't be asked to score it. That's why you don't see everybody is being asked. Um, but let's say 
you choose that. And obviously with three people, it's, you know, it, it kind of, it, it doesn't go to the same kind of spread. If you have a group of people doing this, um, then, um, I think it's a lot better because you get a lot better scoring, but then once everybody puts in their answers and they say wine, whatever it is, then what will happen is the answers you can see it's going on the left and the lobby. Now let's see hairy feet. And it'll start tallying them up. Or not. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, just demoing the game. I saw a question there. Or or we're not demoing the game because for some reason, you know, I love it when this kind of thing happens during um, an actual event, right? You do it a million times uh, before the event and then you get to the actual thing. And then for some reason, something goes funny. Now, let's try this again. Something did go funny. Let's, now let's try a new game. Let's see if it ends there. I'm going to blame Chris. Chris, are you watching? I'm totally blaming you, Chris. All right, let's do this. Whew. Pay no pen, pay no attention. Pay no attention. There we go. Let's try that again. Uh, H F S H F S and I H F S go, go, go. Oh, I did two player threes, but that's okay. No one's watching, right? Oh, someone joined. That's great. <laughs> someone grabbed the link up there and added themselves to the game. That's wonderful. Actually, that's really funny. I really should make one a player one because I kind of did that by accident. Here we go. Let's go ahead and start. That was funny, <laughs> someone. So now we have four players. Let's see what someone does. <laughs> you know, I'm I was curious to see if someone was going to do that. <laughs> All right, let's see. Try this again. All right, and I wonder if someone got in there and voted as well. We'll find out. Okay. All right, so hopefully this goes a little smoother this time. But you know, you get these fun uh, XKCD comics in the in in the in between. But as people are voting, it will tally up here on the side. Oh, even more people popped in. That's too funny. Oh, here we go. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so I think you're getting the idea, right? Uh, clearly, somebody else put one of those in. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to vote for the plastic virus model because that's funny. And yeah. but, but you get the idea, right? This is the game. Um, and then after everybody votes and you go through some rounds and the, the, the scores are tallied up and then you see the winter there, uh, or the winner in the lobby. <laughs> You know, it's funny. I don't know how that gets better with age, but it is funny, so I'm just going to go for it. Looks like we're going... There we go. Okay. And then in a moment, yep, it tallies it up, and it looks like... How hilarious. Whoever someone is, good job, because you put in funny stuff, and you ended up winning it. So I think you get the idea, right? That's the feel of the game. That's what it's doing. Now, again, this has been implemented up in in Jamstack, right? This has been implemented in our Jamstack stack. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to make this today. So with that, let's go ahead and get into the content. Now, first thing first, it would probably be really nice if I dropped all of you. Yes, well done, someone. I agree. Um, if I just drop you the wiki, the link that we're going to work off today. So all of our workshops, I just dropped everyone a link. Um, are in GitHub, right? So we build them in GitHub. We we also build them to be self-service, right? Um, so even if you can't say do everything with us today or whatever, you can always come back to this and do it later. And we're always here. We're always here to lend support on our Discord channel and that kind of thing. 
Now, one thing I do want to point out, though, is notice the link I dropped has this wiki, right? If you go to the, the core project, if you go to the, the root page, um, you will be brought to an initial page here. Um, that is actually something I'm going to show you later. Uh, that is for when you're using the sample gallery in Astra. Um, that's not what we're doing today. If you notice at the very, very bottom, if you go there, it says open the workshop. You want to go into the workshop, go to that wiki link that I pasted. That's where you should be. So you should see something that looks like this. I want you at home. And what we're going to do, here's the format of today. So for some of these sections, myself and Kirsten are going to go through some of the materials. We're going to start explaining some things to you. And then as we get down to the bottom, you're going to see these big green buttons that say next, right? Um, something like this. Um, so the idea here is that we're going to follow these buttons linearly through the workshop, through some of the things we're going to talk about, and then through the exercises. If you want to skip ahead, that's totally up to you. Just, you know, be advised that you're going to be a little out of sync with what we're saying. But that's, again, that's up to you. All right, let me see. How are we doing questions? Just checking. We yeah. did have an earlier question. Okay. Somebody asked uh, if the if you could sort of describe better what Jamstack is. I'm just um, about to do uh, that. Yes. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to at least let everybody kind of see what the game is. Get get Menti started. Mm -hmm. We're gonna totally talk sure. more about what Jamstack is. Yeah. Yes, yes, Argan. Uh, the stream is going to be saved. Once the stream is done, it will become available through the same link on YouTube. Okay. Um, and Yenos, you know, let's see, make sure here, I'll drop you a link. Try that link again. All righty. Okay. So first thing I want to point out, um, that when you go to the homepage, this is where the base wiki is. Uh, you will see this table of contents here. Yes, you can use those links if you want to jump around. Obviously, we're going to be going linearly through the content. Um, also, at any point, too, you'll see this table of contents is going to follow you on the right-hand side. Again, you don't need to know where we are in all of this. That's just more if you want to jump around and go to a specific section. But what we are going to do is say this next move to Jamstack, uh, and then we'll talk about Jamstack and explain that out. All right. So now we're in this, what is Jamstack? Now, if you want to, every time we get to a section, I can go ahead and paste that in so you can see exactly where we are. Okay, so somebody was just asking about Jamstack. Can we explain a little bit more about Jamstack and what that is? Totally, right? It wouldn't be very fair for us to bring you into a Jamstack workshop and not at least talk about that. Um, so Jamstack is kind of a, a new architecture, if you will. It's a new stack for the web. Um, that takes a lot of the modern technologies that we now have available and puts them together right in in essentially a single platform or a pipeline of things that tools that you use um, to be able to deploy an application from start to production being accessible on global cdns using front-end code uh, with a full uh, continuous integration continuous development pipeline um, there, that's a lot baked into it and that's kind of the point um, these are things that individually a lot of development teams would have to come up with on their own and, and build all these integrations. Jamstack, the idea is this is being done right out of the box, right? Uh, so Jamstack, the JAM, the J-A-M stands for JavaScript API in markup. Um, so all of this in the Jamstack is going to use JavaScript. Now, if you think about that, that's kind of key because especially for front-end developers, historically, if you wanted to deploy something on your own, well, what would you need? Well, you probably need, you know, backend developers. You need to have integration between the front and the back end, all sorts of things. But what we're saying here today is with Jamstack, you can actually do the whole application from the front end. You can actually do it from the front end. And I'll, we'll, we'll show you how with like serverless functions and such. Um, the API piece and, and markup, you're going to see as we kind of scroll down here, there are some other options. Um, so you're not like, tied into a particular flavor of JavaScript. You're not tied in per, to, to a particular vendor or whatever, or particular types of APIs. You'll see that there are options that you can choose. The other thing about Jamstack to understand is that it uses static pages to deliver the content as compared to rendering content at runtime, right? So traditionally, what do you do? You create some kind of website, it's got capability, you load that up on your server, the user, they go to your page, and then it renders the view real time. In the case of Jamstack, though, you actually pre-render all of the pages. This is part of the process. And in doing so, you're actually serving up 
static content. Now, it's not fully static, meaning that you can get dynamic. You can make things dynamic by hooking up to backend microservices. Those are the serverless functions. We're going to talk about that. Um, but the point being, why would you do this? Because it's faster. That's essentially what it comes down to. Um, you can use the combination of CDNs with their edge devices uh, and the statically generated content to be able to serve up websites and pages much faster than you can when you're doing it by rendering real time. So looking at some of the languages, right? So we've kind of marked the ones we're going to use today. Um, so one, the J and Jamstack JavaScript, um, it can leverage multiple JavaScript frameworks. So you can see here, we're going to use React.js today, but you could use Angular or Vue. Um, the APIs, again, we're going to use REST today, but you can use REST GraphQL. You know, there's other options there. And the same thing with the markup. Again, this application is using vanilla HTML, but you could in fact use Markdown if you wanted to. Now I mentioned the static page piece. Um, if I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. So if it's not familiar, please say something. Essentially what we're saying here is that, again, we're going to pre-build. When we build, we're going to pre-render all of the pages out. Those are actually being pushed out to um, the various devices that in, are in the CDN, the content delivery network. Um, and that way, when users go to interact with your site, they're going to get those static pages very fast. So that is part of the stack is to uh, have a static page generator. Now, as I mentioned CDN, if you're not familiar with a CDN, this is generally what it is. Traditionally, what would you have? You'd have like a single web server or web servers, right? Your site would be hosted on those servers. And then users would connect to those servers and they would go there to get to your site. But what happens, let's pretend for a moment, you have a server that's over here in North America, say on the East Coast, but you have a ton of users that are over here in Australia. They're not going to get the same experience as a set of users that are there in the Americas. Why? Physics, right? Speed of light, actually speed of wire. Electrons can only buzz so fast across the wire. And the distance from somewhere like, say, Australia all the way over to here, it's long enough that it really incurs a lot of latency. Um, so by today's standards, we expect everything, including us, we expect everything to be near instantaneous. If you go to someone's application or their website and it's slow and there's a lot of lag and such, you're, you're probably going to go away, right? So we've come to expect that things are going to happen pretty quick. So what CDNs do is they take your content and they distribute it out on edge servers, right? You see these edge devices that are out there. And they do this automatically as part of their system. You don't have to manually do this yourself. This is part of what Netlify is going to do and what we're going to work on today. So instead of then having that single server where everything is coming out of, now your content has been spread around the globe on this network. So when a user in Australia down here then is interacting with your site, they're actually going to a local server right there as compared to having to go all the way back, right? That's what the CDN part is doing. And then if you look at kind of, again, the traditional way that we used to do things or, you know, we've always done things for, for decades now, actually, um, you know, you've got your client that's going to talk to some web server, maybe some app servers in the background, then that's going to be hooked up to your database and so on. If you notice with Jamstack, it consolidates this, right? So you still have the client interaction, but as I mentioned a minute ago, instead of going to a web server where it's going to be rendered real time, it's actually serving stuff up statically from the CDN. Any of that dynamic content that you want, right? Um, when you say are pulling data from a database or writing something there, you want to change something on the screen, that's actually happening in microservices through your APIs. Uh, and then that interaction with the database occurs there. Okay. Oh, CDN is Content Delivery Network. Yeah. And by the way, I want to point something out. There's going to, we're going to kind of go high level, high level. We're going to kind of gloss over some of this stuff, right? Ask your questions, please do. Um, you know, because we do have a lot to get through. So we're not going to go like a deep dive into everything. However, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and I'll come back. At the end of each section, there is a want to learn more piece. We've tried to curate as much like useful links and knowledge as we can and put them in here. So you've noticed for some of you asking questions about CDNs, right? Boom. Here are some links specific to that. So you can really get a little deeper dive and get some of those answers. Okay. Kirsten, are there any other questions? I just, I happen to see that one. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen any. I'm, I'm fighting with Skype again. So. Okay. Okay. Um. Let's see. All right. So 
Um, we've already talked a little bit about the pre-rendering piece, what that does for you. That really comes down to performance. That's what it's about. You pre-render the pages, they're statically generated. That way, when um, your users hit them, they don't have to wait for the real-time render. It's faster is what it comes down to. Um, Jamstack also decouples your um, your your front end, your back end, and everything like that. It's decoupled as compared to being in a single monolith where you have one application that contains everything, right? So you'll find that in, J in Jamstack, we're going to use more microservices and APIs and modularize things. So if you're wondering, well, what's a microservice? Well, if you think about it, maybe I have um, a need to say, um, read and write to my database, right? Do I need to embed that code in the whole application? Or is that something that I can actually have a microservice that it does that one thing? And then I expose an API to my code. Then from the front end, all I have to do is hit the API and I let it do its deal. Or maybe I have some calculation I want to perform or you know some little function. Those are really good cases for microservices to take those on. Now, one of the benefits of those by modularizing your code and using things like microservices is then for one, it's actually, you know, even though you may have more microservices, it's it's easier to kind of digest, if you will, especially from a development standpoint. Let's say that you need to just modify a couple lines in your database interaction microservice, but you don't want to have to modify the whole app or you don't want to have to have the whole app reviewed or anything. You could just modify that one microservice. That's kind of where, you know, breaking things up and making more modular really comes into play. Um, and then as we mentioned on the CDN, um, the CDNs, especially in a case like Netlify, where it's a global CDN, for doing really nothing, you get your sites distributed globally as part of the platform. That's not something that you actually have to do uh, on your own. Hey, David. Yeah, go ahead. Um, somebody, somebody asked uh, a question, which is, uh, a, it's a great question. It's what is an API? Um, some people are not uh, not sure like what we're talking about. So yeah. I, I've been I feeling Kirsten that, that that's one that you want to hit. <laughs> yeah. So go um, for it. I, I just want to I want to start um, a little bit further back than what's an API itself. I want to say uh, if you have a mobile phone and that mobile phone has an application on it, um, like Twitter or something, uh, there's there's an interface between your mobile application and Twitter. And that interface is what we usually mean when we're talking about APIs. It's a it's a defined way to interact with someone else's system. Um, you know, we used to have the server client where they were very coupled tightly together, but the API makes it possible for the server to present the information in a known way so that clients can use it. So um, what Stargate gives you is, is uh, there's GraphQL is one kind of API. It's not a, a database system. It is that interface. Um, it's, the, it's just the different way to talk to that data and explore it. Um, and REST and the document database we'll be using here today. So th mm -hmm. these are all just different faces on your same uh, uh, database and different ways for you to interact with it. Um, so that's that's what an API. Is. Excellent. And Pietro in YouTube, does Jamstack give you any help with continuous integration? Yes, it does. We're going to do that today. It's actually when we first when I first got into this particular project that I had like a cool. There's such a coolness factor with the things that you get just using this kind of platform. Um, but CI and CD is totally integrated in what we're going to do. Okay, so moving on a little bit, why is this cool then, right? So after, you know, aside from all the things we've already talked about, um, one thing here is security. You might not think that, why would this enhance my security? Well, think about what's happening here. We're statically generating our pages and then pushing them out on a CDN. So pushing them out away from our original origin web server, right? So what this does is add a layer of obfuscation between hackers and the amount of attack vectors they have and how, you know, them getting back to your server. Because if you think about it, a hacker wants to do what? They want to get to your server. That's where they're trying to get to, you know, to, you know, perform their nefarious deeds. But um, if you statically generate the content, then that reduces an attack vector. If you push the content away from the actual server where it's originating from and they can't get to that, it reduces an attack vector, right? So this is actually one way to kind of naturally start to increase your security. 
Uh, scalability, I think we've already kind of touched on. Just the fact of being distributed on a CDN and what that does for you makes a huge difference in your scalability. Plus, again, since the sites or the pages are being statically generated, um, that by itself can actually help your performance a lot. Um, and then that gets into the next one. I'll admit when um, Cedric originally put this on here when we were writing these, this one threw me off too. I thought something was wrong with my page and then I read it and got the joke. Um, but, but yeah, this is another reason why, you know, here you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, something getting stuck in render time or whatever, cause everything's been pre-rendered. Uh, so performance is definitely a lot better. Um, as far as like maintainability, uh, and portability, um, maintainability now, especially, and I'm not saying that full stack devs, this doesn't apply or backend devs that the, this doesn't apply, but especially for the front end folks, um, or anybody who maintains an application today on their own, with their own IT staff, with their own servers and their own infrastructure, right? The difference here is you're able to use existing cloud-based services and tools to do all of the maintenance for you. Um, so that is a pretty significant decrease in the amount of maintain maintaining that you need to do and the amount of work that you need to do. You can actually be a lone developer, create an app and use the service to push something out on a global CDN and have it managed. Like, that's awesome, really, is what it comes down to. Um, and then finally here, from the portability standpoint, um, you know, since the pages are pre-built and statically generated, uh, you don't have to worry about having special hosting solutions or be locked into a vendor. You can pretty much push that anywhere. Uh, and as far as the developer experience goes, that's what we're just about to do. Okay, last part of this section, so we can actually get into doing things, uh, is Netlify. A little bit more information on Netlify. Um, now, we already talked about a lot of the things that Netlify uh, provides. Um, part of that is going to be that global CDN. Uh, it's also going to provide uh, APIs, serverless functions. Um, there is integration. What we're going to do in just a moment here, you're going to start to see the, the beginning of that integration between GitHub and Netlify. And there's an integration that's set up. So when you create a new Netlify site off of your GitHub repository, that actually sets up the CI CD pipeline. And so as you start to push changes into your master branch and such that automatically kicks off your unit, your functional tests and all of that. Right. Um, so this is all within Netlify and that is just scratching the surface of what it does. But those are some of the functions we're going to use today. Um, so for today, we're going to have all of our code in GitHub. Um, as I just mentioned, our GitHub, each of you is going to create your own repository. That's going to get integrated with your Netlify. By the way, this is all free free services. We do things on free tier in our workshops. There should be no point where you ask for a credit card. You have to pay anything ever. Um, we're also going to use uh, an IDE called Gitpod. So this is online. We'll provide you the instructions on how to do that. There are local options. You may have heard me say this in the beginning. Um, we have provided both ways. We do recommend, though, go with the Gitpod way. Why? Because we preload all of your dependencies and everything. We get it set up for you so you can just go, right? Um, and then the final thing here is right here with Astra. So for those of you who are familiar with Apache Cassandra, we are in fact using Apache Cassandra under the hood. Uh, that is being enabled by Datastax Astra. That is uh, our Apache Cassandra as a service in the cloud service. Um, there's another piece here though, and we'll talk more about it later called Stargate, right? Uh, and this little tidbit is kind of for my existing Cassandra users. You know, when you interact with Cassandra, you're used to having to create uh, tables, you know, use CQL queries, go through drivers or whatever. Stargate, though, offers up REST, GraphQL, and Document API, APIs, uh, Document APIs on top of Cassandra. And that includes OSS Cassandra, what we're going to do in Astra, and Deus Ex Enterprise. Um, the real cool thing about Astra is when you spin this up, Stargate's already there. You don't have to do anymore. Okay, so as I mentioned before, if you want to dig deeper into any of those sections, um, then there are all sorts of links. But before we do that, we are going to get into. Restrictions are there uh, before you start getting charged. Yeah. So. You know, the, as long as you stay in the free tier, I believe in the way that Netlify works, um, you have to go past, and it actually tells you what it is 
in the UI. You have to choose to do it. To give you some context, though, um, I've been using Netlify now for months, and I have probably, in creating this workshop and working on it, killed and created hundreds of sites, <laughs> and I am still using the free tier. I've had no limitation on anything that I can do. Now, am I, you know, pushing through thousands of operations a second and doing things like that? No. Um, so I would invite you, and we do have some Netlify documentation here to take a look at their um, their documentation on what are the levels there, but I do believe you actually have to, you have to choose that. I've never actually been prompted to put in a credit card or anything. It's, it, as I understand it, is the free tier is free uh, until you decide that you want to go to the paid tiers. Okay. Okay, all right, so let's move on. So what we're going to do is we're going to lab one, set up and deploy. And here's what I want you to notice. At the top here, you're going to see this exercise time. So we're going to take approximately 15 minutes for this. Um, so the format is going to be this. We're going to give you the 15 minutes to do the exercise and we're going to be quiet. But at the tail five minutes, we're going to verbally, we're going to start looking at some Q&A. We're going to start answering some stuff in the chats. We're going to let you do the work. The last five minutes, um, we will um, start verbally answering some things. And then we're going to move into our first quiz. So here, let me go ahead and drop this link for everybody. Here you go. So again, if you're following along. Oh, and if you're asking how to create the GitHub repository, you're going to do that here in a moment, right? I saw that question pop up. Um, so everything that you're going to need is in the instructions that we're going to go through. All right, with that, everybody go ahead and get your 15 minutes. Like I said, we'll be quiet, mostly. And then we'll answer some questions here at the end. I will actually go through this with you, but I'll do it silently just so you can use that for reference. Thank you. 
By the way, I did forget one thing that I need to tell everybody. Notice up on your Menti that you'll see this lab one set up and deploy. When you're done with your lab, give us a thumbs up here so we know you're done.
All right, we're coming down to our last five minutes. I do see a lot of people gave thumbs up so far, so that's great. I am seeing some questions here. I think I've seen a couple folks um, saying that they gave Battlestax a repository name. It says it's not found. Uh, Chitvan over in Discord. Let me take a look at the link you dropped here. Let's see what's going on. Right, so if you're so you're going to want to go uh, to the root of Datastacks examples Battlestacks, right? And when I do that, I have used this template. Um, that should be enough. Now, obviously, I've already created mine, um, but if I click that, then that'll bring me to this dialog. But at that point, it should be copying Datastacks examples Battlestacks. Is that what you're seeing? And then, yeah, and then you can just put in Battlestacks for the repository. That's because right. That's the name that it's going to. That, that's right. Now, I've already created. It's coming from. Yes, yes. Right. So here, yeah, you do. Now, mine's complaining because I already did it, right? Um, but yes, you would right. put Battlestacks in here. Uh, don't forget to include all branches. That is in the instruction. Um, uh, make sure that you get that. Uh, that's That part is important. But let's see if that gets you further. And I'll leave that up here for a second. Any other questions or things that we should address, Kirsten, that you're seeing? <laughs> Mostly, I'm just wondering why it is that Skype always freezes me with a really grumpy look. <laughs> <on my face. laughs> Those are the best times, right? You're just like... <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, thanks for all the, the feedback that, that you've given, guys. Uh, we're definitely make sure that the instructions are very explicit that you need to have a GitHub account and be logged into it. I think we mentioned it, but um, maybe we maybe we need, we to, need to mention a little, a little bit more. I'm noticing a lot of yeah. the same points, so it, it seems like that's kind of tripping some folks up. Um, but yes, and we you, definitely don't want you guys to get to get blocked by something that yeah. we're assuming. Um, yeah. So, so to that point, right? Um, yes, you do need to have a GitHub account. I'm sorry I did not mention that right off the bat. Um, because you're going to copy, you're going to create, use that template to copy our repo into your own repo because you're going to deploy that to your own production CDN, right? So you do need an account for GitHub. So if not, you'll have to go um, and create an account there. Now, one thing to note is I'm, I'm actually using the Brave browser throughout this whole thing, but Brave, giving it, given its nature and what it does, it suppresses a lot, right? Um, so depending on the browser you're using, you might want to watch to see if you get any pop-up blockers or things like that. You may need to allow some access in some browsers because I'm seeing a couple questions come through along like, hey, I, I didn't get this dialogue or whatever. And a lot of the times that's security settings in your browser. Let's see. Okay. Um, uh, Baljeet, in YouTube, we need to select web app and Netlify. So in Netlify, let me go back. Um, what it's actually going to do, and if we go to the instruction here, you should see this, right? When you create your account, you should see this new site from Git. Um, so once you have, you click that button, you associate it with the GitHub repository that you just created. Um, what you saw me doing, you don't have to do. Um, this was the initial deploy that happened. I don't know if this is what you're asking about. Um, I just clicked on that so I can kind of see the log and see what was going on as it did the initial deploy. Uh, but all you should have to do at this point is do new site from Git, follow the prompts uh, to associate it with your Battlestacks repo, the one that you created, and that's it. It'll go ahead and deploy on its own. The game, oh, Vinit, good question. The game is not already done. What we have done is we provided the most of the, um, the stubs. We provided you stubs that you're going to fill in, right? So there's a lot of the game that's actually completed off, but there are some parts that we're going to focus on today that are not. Okay, how are we doing on time? We've got about a minute and a half left here. Okay. Cool. Wonderful. And if you are done, please give us the thumbs up over here so we have an idea of how many of you are getting through. Great. Yes, Chandra, and YouTube. Totally. Um, select, you should have an option for uh, a European region as well. Select the one closest to you. Um, the, the free tier has two regions. It's it's either East or uh, EMEA. I would select EMEA probably in your case. Let's 
sí. Now I will say, if you, for some of you, I see who are who probably already launched it, and you noticed that um, uh, you can you can try using the app. It's not going to do anything yet because we have not the the insert game function is only stubbed out. It doesn't actually have any guts yet. We're going to do that here in a minute. Um, so if you try to do the game, it may not do anything just yet, but we will get there. All right, so we are down to our last five seconds. Wonderful. All right, let's go ahead and turn that timer off. But here we're going to go. We're going to move into our first game. So you are going to want to get yourself ready for this. All right, everyone, get to Menti. Time for a game. Time for a quiz, I should say. It's going to be the first question in the quiz. I will let folks get a moment to get back into the Menti. Um, if you weren't in yet and you want to get in, again, go to your QR code or go to menti.com, 912328. All righty. And are we ready? Let's go ahead and start the first one now. Look at your phones. Look at wherever you're running Menti. There might be lag in the video. What does the Jam and Jamstack stand for? JavaScript Angular Metrics, Java Assembly Monolithic, JavaScript API Markup, Jam Apples Molasses. Something about this kind of music that makes you want to do your hands like this, right? That's right. The correct answer was, in fact, JavaScript API Markup. That is what the JAM stands for. So let's take a look at our leaderboard. So you'll find in the quiz that speed does matter, but so also does correctness. And let's see what happens here. All right, so Aiden won, was the fastest with the correct answer, so is currently in first place. Beethoven in second place, and Ariel in third. All right, let's go ahead and move then to our second lab. So excellent. Thank you everyone for playing. That is just the first question. So we're going to want to stay in there uh, and we'll do more of that. Oh, you like that? Do you like the music, Jordan? That was fun. <laughs> you know, and on if it doesn't ask for your name and you just move on, it will Menti will automatically assign you one. OK, so we're going to now move in to Lab 2, create your Astra instance. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. This one is going to be 10 minutes. Um, and I see, you know, something I will give you. I'm so sorry, Muhammad. I see that next time I'll give you a little bit more time for the mentee. That's what I was trying to um, allude to in the beginning uh, when I mentioned that to keep your mentee open. And, you know, we, we have the survey questions. Hoping everyone was in there. We have a lot of us on today. I'll give you more time. But guess what? It doesn't mean you're out of the game, right? There's seven questions. And trust me, with mentee, it's anyone's game for that. All right, let's go ahead and get our 10 minute timer going. There it is. Again, we are doing lab two. Here you go. This is lab two. I appreciate your understanding there. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'll I'll wait more. But now you know now you know what to expect, right? <laughs> you know what I'm gonna jump right into the mentee and go. But yeah, I'll, I'll wait more for the next one for everybody. It's the top three that can win swag for the Menti. Okay. All right. So for this one, we have 10 minutes. Go ahead and follow the instructions to create your Astra instance. And just like before, I'm going to go ahead and do this with you. And one other thing I'll mention real quick, and then I'll be quiet for the 10 minutes. Um, the the estimates in here do include read time. We're not expecting you to just go lightning through and and try to just do all the commands and everything you see. Um, we are trying to give you some time so you can actually read what's on the page and kind of grok what's there. I just wanted to point that out.
Okay, great. It looks like a lot of you have your Astra Instance already created. It does go pretty quick. And we are coming up to our five-minute mark. Okay, so we're at the five minute mark. So what I'll do is I see some of you asking questions about Cassandra, and I expect that actually. Um, we haven't really talked much about what Cassandra <laughs> is. We will in a section that's coming up, but why not? We can totally talk about it now. Um, Cassandra is a distributed NoSQL database, right? Um, it's been around for a little bit more than 10 years now, used by a vast majority of the Fortune 100 companies. There is, there's almost no, if you go on your phone right now and you pick an app, or something, I guarantee you're using it somewhere. And what Cassandra is really known for, other than just being distributed, is that it, the way that it, it scales and, and how it handles that. So Cassandra is known for being able to maintain performance at scale. That's whether you have three nodes or thousands of nodes. And by performance, we're talking on the orders for writes in micro or milliseconds, and in the course in case of reads, in the order of milliseconds. Um, and it, in particular, it scales horizontally. Uh, as compared to vertically. So if I'm vertically scaling this, something, um, I'm going to add more CPU. I'm going to add more memory. I'm going to add faster and bigger drives and that kind of deal. I'm going to scale up and up and up and up. But you can only go so far that way where Cassandra scales out, right? So you add on more nodes if you want to scale it up. And you can do this while you're running in real time uh, without having any downtime. So it's known for its robustness. It's known for its performance at scale. Um, Uber, Spotify, PlayStation, which I always thought was fun. Net, uh, Netflix. Um, anytime you're in a in a Netflix, right? Uh, every time you're pausing, playing, you're interacting, uh, recommendations, whatever. That's all coming from Cassandra. Um, most of uh, you know your credit cards, banks, uh, FedEx, Home Depot, Target, Lowe's. I mean, there are so many big players of things that we use every day that are using Cassandra, right? So Astra is 
that, it's Cassandra in the cloud. It's a managed Cassandra database. So what you're seeing here is when we created this, we just created our own Cassandra cluster right here, but it's being managed for you. So the trick with Cassandra, um, a lot of people, you know, if you look at running it, it's been kind of considered like a Porsche or Lamborghini where, yes, it's amazing at what it does, but it can be really finicky, right? If you don't know how to run it properly. So what we've done for you with Astra is we've essentially taken that management need out of the equation. You just come over here and you start it up and go. Um, what's really cool about this here is that especially from a development standpoint, especially using the free tier, you can spin one of these up, get going, hook up your plumbing, make your app work, do all that. And if you decide you want to go to open source and, and run your own Cassandra, you can totally do that with the same driver, same code and everything. Um, so it is a really awesome resource from a development standpoint to stand up the database that's essentially used for uh, all the big players. Okay. All right, let's take a look. In our time, we're down. We got two minutes left. All right. And let me take a look at how are we doing on 124. Good, complete. Excellent. All right, so I think we're pretty good. I mean, oh, yeah, Vignes, I see the cap theorem. Yes, cap theorem is wonderful there. Um, yeah, um, I am I am SRC <laughs> in Discord. How is Cassandra different than Mongo? Um, the one biggest thing that I'll just point out is... Uh, where Mongo at some point, well, Mongo 1 is a document DB. Cassandra is not. It's actually, by nature, um, it's going to be more of what you consider like how you'd see relational with a tabular format. Funny enough, with Stargate, which we're going to talk about here soon, it does in fact support a document DB. That's what we're using today. The big difference, though, is as you start to pull away in scalability, Mongo starts to hit some limits uh, where Cassandra doesn't, right? Cassandra is essentially indefinitely scalable. Um, and there's definite differences on... Um, the way that Cassandra ha handles robustness. There is no master node in Cassandra. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system. All nodes can do what any other nodes do. This means from resiliency, you can actually have, in some cases, two-thirds of your cluster down and still be up and still be available and still be able to facilitate uh, operations and, and writes and reads and everything. So um, there, there are definitely some differentiators between the two, but... We don't really focus on that here much. We're not trying to, you know, get in and poo poo on Mongo or anybody. Um, but yeah, I would say when it comes to resiliency and scalability, that's the the big difference there. All right, let's see. All right, so we've got about thirty seconds left, and do we have some more folks coming in? One hundred thirty-five. Great. Kirsten, there anything that we should talk about? No. Any I, questions I, we need to I, hit? I think it seems like everybody's getting through really I well. I think so. Um, I think so. Okay. All right, I'm gonna uh, uh, I'm gonna detach my external monitor and okay. see if it exists. Okay, cool. All right, all right. Well, I am going to stop the timer for now. Let's go ahead and move in. You know, uh, Ruben, some of us, I guess it depends on who you're asking, who are Americans. <laughs> uh, there are some. We have a global team, uh, so Kirsten and I, yes, but others on the team are actually from uh, France and Russia, um, England. Yeah, we've got folks around. All righty, let's go ahead and move in to the next section over here. So what I'm gonna do is move into this Netlify section. So again, if you're following along here, I'm going to go next, move to Netlify, and I'll drop the link for everybody. There we go. Okay. Okay, so for this section, really, I'm just going to go a little bit deeper into Netlify. We just kind of introduced it in the beginning, um, but it would probably help to know a little bit more about it. Um, now, one of the things to point out, and you're already starting to see some of this integration, when you created your Netlify site from your Git repository, some things automatically happened for you, right? Um, so if I take a look at the site settings, we're just going to, I just want you to see something, right? So in Netlify, by default, what it's going to do is it's going to say, hey, I'm going to go off of your master branch as your production branch, and I'm going to trigger off of any commits to that branch, right? So anytime anything changes in master, it's going to kick off an automatic deploy in Netlify. Now, there's a distinction between things that are you're just testing something out like a pull request compared to I want to actually push this to production. I am merging it back into master, right? And Netlify makes those distinctions. Um, 
Well, what's cool here is that you're not limited to just these settings. If you want to include other branches or something, you can totally do that. But for our purposes today, we're going to stick to master. And it's the same thing with building, right? Um, you'll see here that um, the build command is configured to be npm run build. Anyone working with the JavaScript frameworks and, and such is probably familiar with this. Uh, again, you can configure that differently. But that's really the, the kind of the point here is that Netlify has flexibility there. Um, and you can configure it to do all sorts of things in build time and how you want it to deploy. But for now, we're going to use um, those, uh, those default features. Netlify also gives you the ability to, you know, you can turn on monitoring. You can see that. Um, somebody already mentioned it earlier. Um, you can actually set up a custom domain, right? And now for what we're doing today, we don't require that. You don't need to do it. Uh, it'll just generate one for you. Um, but you can, in fact, set up a custom domain and you can secure everything with HTTPS. And that's part of the service, right? Uh, so that's nothing you have to do explicitly in your own code or anything like that. Um, they've got some other capabilities um, with like their forms where you can get like automatic notifications about new form submissions, which is really cool. What I found really neat in working with Netlify so far um, are both the command line interface and the APIs there. Um, they clearly expect folks to be doing things from an IT perspective programmatically behind the scenes, not just through the UI. And both the CLI and the API are pretty, they're pretty expressive, right? You could do a lot. And if you notice, by the way, notice there's a link in each one of these, right? So if you want to dig in and get more on the docs, then I would encourage you to do that. Okay, so moving on real quick. Now, the part that I really want to focus on today, though, is the Netlify functions. I've seen some questions on this already. Um, this is the core. This is how we're going to add in the dynamicism into our app. Because again, remember, we've created static pages, right? We're going to generate those static pages. Well, how do I then change the things on my page? How do I, you know, how do I do that? That's where the Netlify functions come in. These are your serverless functions, right? And here's what I really want to point out. Notice here, this knock, this call out to the Netlify toolbar. So if we take a look at our repository that we created, if we scroll down, you see this Netlify tumult here. This is the configuration that Netlify is going to use to tell it things like, oh, what am I using to build? Oh, where is my functions directory? My serverless functions directory, we're telling it it's functions. So in my app, and we're going to do this here in a moment, you're going to see there's a functions directory. If I drop functions in that directory, and then if I export and export a handler in a function like this. That's all you need to do. From that point on, Netlify will see this as a serverless function and it will deploy it as such. So even though these are just stubbed out and they're not doing anything just yet, here's what I want you to see. If I go to functions here in Netlify, notice, what's, notice what we have. Oh, well, I'm being... For some reason, Skype just dropped and um, it's asking me interesting things. Uh, give me just a second. I don't know what's going on with this. <laughs> okay, let me turn that off. Give me just bear with me just a moment here. Oh, I see what's going on. Okay. Here, I will set this. Give me a second. It looks like Kirsten was having issues with her computer. So let me go ahead and set it up so she can just drop right back in. And then I will go back to what we were talking about. There we go. Okay. All right. So, so as I was mentioning a moment ago, right? So because we have these two stubbed out here, right? Hello world and insert game. Um, then, and we've also, and you'll see in the stubs when we go to build them, they're both exporting a handler uh, and they're dropped in the functions directory. That's it. That's enough to tell Netlify, go ahead and build these as serverless functions. Now, from the want to learn more thing, you'll see there's less links here. Both of these are good. However, this tutorial right here, I really encourage you to check it out. If you want to get a lot deeper into um, the Netlify functions and how they work and all that, go check that out. That it's a, it's a really nice resource. All right. So with that, We are going to move into our lab three. But you know something, Kirsten, are you back? No, okay, not yet. All right, so what we're gonna do actually right before we do that is we have another quiz to take.
So let's do this time. I will wait for you a little bit longer. I promise. I will wait. I may have just lied. All right. So what is Astra? It's an in a local in memory version of Cassandra. It is Cassandra as a service in the cloud. It's a development tool. It's a gateway to the stars. All right, the correct answer was, it is Cassandra as a service in the cloud. Absolutely correct. And let's take a look at our leaderboard. How are we doing this time? The timings, the, the speed timings are always the fun part. Oh, see how it changes? All right, so we have uh, H. Lysias, H. L. Lysias. How am I saying that one? <laughs> and number one, sorry. Ariel, number two, and Aiden, number one, you're still holding in the top three. Uh, like I said, this can be anybody's game as we move forward. All righty. Now, we're going to get into some of the fun here in Lab 3. So we're going to move to Lab 3 Hello World. Now you're going to deploy your first serverless function, right? So we're going to give you about 20 minutes again for this. Follow the instructions. Um, now, one thing I do want to point out before you get started, you'll see there's two options, Git Pod or Local. This is the one that we suggest that you do use Gitpod uh, because everything is pre-built for you. You can just get in and start doing things in code. Um, local's not that bad, honestly, but you do have some dependencies and stuff that you need to account for. Um, so we do suggest that you do it in the Gitpod way just so you can be on the same page with everybody. All right, let me go ahead and get our timer going. There we go. You know, I'll answer your question real quick, Ruben, in voice. Uh, it's, you know, it's not, I'm not trying to say that Gitpod is better than like VS Code or, or Eclipse or whatever like that. Um, from what we're doing in these workshops, we're able to pre-bake the IDE and the configuration and the dependencies for you in Gitpod. Um, so it's really nice. Plus, this way you don't have to download anything. You're doing it all up in the cloud. That's why, that's why we use them for these workshops. Gitpod is actually a great resource. If you're working with GitHub, you can just launch Gitpod right out of your code and, and work against it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm with you, Ruben, yeah. <laughs> Yep, and again, once you finish, give us a thumbs up. Let us know you're done. And hey, Kirsten, I see you're back. Woo! I am back. It's very exciting. I looked at all the troubleshooting sites, and the one thing I hadn't even done was restart my computer. So here we are. <laughs> well, hopefully that does it. All right, and I have to do this along with everybody. Oh, man. <laughs> you need to have uh, now playing uh, widget so people know what the news is. Um, this is, let me get you, uh, let me get you that one if I can.
Yeah, just a not notice about Gitpod. Um, I do wonder, we have a lot of you on today. Um, I do wonder if the Gitpod folks are going to call us up after this <laughs> today. Um, so if, if, if Gitpod is taking a moment, that's all right. Um, usually it's pretty quick. Usually it just takes a, m a minute or so. Um, but even I can tell that it, it feels like it's, um, with maybe with all of us on, we're stressing them a little bit. So I would say, give it, a, give it another moment. And if you're really frustrated, we do have uh, the local instructions, but we're not going to cover them um, our, ourselves. And uh, it's up to you. But if you're an NPM person already and you want to give it a shot, um, those those instructions are available for you to uh, work through. Okay. Yeah, I am noticing, I am seeing some folks that are having, uh, it's taking a moment with Gitpod. You know, you could... Yeah, we are. <laughs> the DJ toes he's got has it right. We're literally DDoSing Gitpod. <laughs> we kind of are. <laughs> the, the, there might be some truth in that. So um, I would ask either be patient. Uh, patient. Now, we could even make it worse. I was going to suggest for some of you, um, you could uh, spin up another, uh, you know, another tab and try it there and see if you have any more luck. Not that it's going to make the problem any better. Um, you know, maybe uh, for future workshops, uh, we could try to provide a Docker container for those of you who are comfortable in Docker yeah. that, you know, has the right setup for you. Um, it, but again, it would be a different experience than what we're talking about. But if you're comfy with Docker and you want to dive in there, um, hopefully we can have that available um, for future workshops in case this happens. By the way, I just need to give a shout out on YouTube to uh, M4RI4. She understands what I just meant there. <laughs> That's Maria. <laughs> Uh, all right, I'm seeing I'm seeing some positive vibes on the Docker idea. Yes, Ruben, this is based on a, 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 a React app, but I'm answering questions verbally too soon. Sorry about that. <laughs> all right, so uh, so we will definitely plan on uh, having a Docker path uh, for our future workshops. Um, to let you guys um, take a different um, path.
Okay, so Maria is saying she finally got our nodes. Have faith in GivePod. So um, maybe it, it seemed like we're kind of giving them a lot of load because we have so many folks on. Um, I think we'll just have to be patient with it. Is what I'm what I got from that. Yeah. Okay, it looks like some are starting to show up. I think you've hit the nail on the head with that, Kirsten. Okay, so we're down to our last uh, four minutes or so. I do see, it seems like for um, for some folks, Gitpod is catching up. I, I think we just kind of slammed it there, so uh, note for the future. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe we need to reach out to the team too and let them know. Maybe they can uh, spin up some extra instances or something when we do this kind of stuff. Um, and I did see, um, I did see a couple conversations with folks in using a fork. Now, you may have missed it in the instruction, um, but we explicitly set it up to use templates, right? And here's why, here's why. If you use a fork, then anytime you try to merge back or you try to go, you, you try to, you know, create a PR, it's going to want to go back to the parent. So what's going to happen is this. It's going to go all the way up. Okay, so you see the parent here. Um, oh, ignore that. Sorry, I'm over here. My bad. There we go. See, it's generated from DataX examples fork. However, if you used a fork instead of a template, which is what this uh, the, we use the template here, then you're going to see this forked from. What that translates into, though, is every time you try to do a PR, it's going to try to default back to going back to our repository for your changes, not your repository. If you use a template, you don't have to worry about that. And every time you do a PR, it'll go correctly to your master. And it will. And by the way, if you used a fork. Every single time I, I looked, I looked so hard. 
<laughs> to see if there's a way in GitHub to default it after using a fork, and I couldn't find anything, right? So um, it is one of those things where you we really, really, really suggest you use the template as we have in the instructions. Otherwise, it's going to get a little more challenging, especially when you're trying to commit your changes and merge back. Um, now, this one, too, this one's got a lot of steps in here. Um, and even though I went through it, um, I do recognize that there's there's a lot going on. I just want to kind of break it down for you just a, a little bit here. Um, so we'll go past the Gitpod stuff. Um, you may have noticed that I asked you all to do a git remote dash V. Why? Because I wanted you to validate that you were in the correct branch, right? Or you're in the correct repo, I should say. Sorry. So notice I'm in Sonic DMG. I'm not at data text examples. That's where I want to be. I know I am trying to commit back to my repo, not the parent repo. Um, setting the origin just makes stuff a little bit easier as you go to commit back. And we want to use my branch. We want to check out dash B, which is going to create a new local branch, my branch for your changes. Now, once we've done that, though, here's what I really want to point out. We go to our hello world. It was stubbed out. We create the new hello world, right? Then when we run, notice what happened um, when we did this next command. Where to go here? This GP preview. What is this doing? This is a git pod function. Um, so GP preview is saying, hey, load this into the preview window. This now, since git pod is a cloud based IDE, you have cloud based URLs. All this is doing here is generating that URL at port 8888, and then it's tagging on Netlify functions, hello world. So this is our serverless function. That's what this did here. This is our serverless function. This, the one that we exported a handler, we put it into our functions directly, directory like we talked about that was configured. Now this is accessible through its serverless function. But what's really neat is when you go, and I saw somebody make this comment, Right. This is awesome. I think this is what is so cool. Once you get this set up uh, about Netlify is once we go to our functions right now, I've got my function. I go to the link that it generated. Notice this right here. That is the same. That's the same endpoint that we use, whether we're local, whether we're up in the cloud, whether we're in our production deployment. So then later on, when I use this is my my Netlify endpoint, but notice I just had to use the same exact access here. Dot Netlify slash functions slash hello world. Boom. There is my hello world function spitting out the output. Um, and then the rest of this here. Now, this is this part. What we're doing is we're taking the changes, right? Because we changed our we changed our hello world code here. So now we're merging this back. We're going to push our my branch. That's why it's important that you use that. Push that back up. Um, the whole flow that we have to go through here with the pull request, if you're not familiar with doing this, right? If you're not familiar with pull requests, this is a wonderful feature in GitHub and you should really use them. I mean, this is like a very strong suggestion as compared to say, just merging right in a master or something, you use a pull request to say, Hey, I want to propose this code. Then you can assign reviewers. You, you have a moment to like, think about what you just did, and then you can choose to merge it. What's awesome about what happens here because we're integrated with Netlify is if we take a look at this PR, this was, I mean, this is so cool. Um, so this is my PR from the change, right? But what happened was an automatic set of unit tests and all sorts of tests were kicked off. I'm trying to find my, um, here it is. It ran, it actually lit in, in GitHub actions, right? This is GitHub actions doing this. It actually went through installed NPM, installed Node, did all that stuff, ran the tests, ran the function tests, did the whole thing right here in GitHub Actions. This is the CI CD pipeline in action. That's exactly what this is doing. Not only that, but with the integration here with Netlify, what did it do? Notice these deploy previews. That's what happens when you create a PR. Every time you create a PR back to master, it's going to create a deploy preview. The point being, it's going through the whole process. It's doing all the checks, ensuring that everything is good before you push to production. So when we came here and it went through all those tests, I saw somebody mentioning, you know, the tests and we got that green light and we said merge. That's what that's what that was about. It actually went through the whole pipeline. And then we could confirm the merge. Once we confirm the merge, then it went and deployed to production. So I just want you to kind of Think about 
the ramifications of what just happened there. Yes, so there's a lot of steps. We went through this one this one time in the beginning, so you could kind of do that. But once you get into this flow, once you hook it up, you make your changes, you create, you know, you push them back, you make a PR, it kicks off the whole pipeline, the whole CI CD pipeline. Once that is good to go, you know you're good to pr push production. You confirm your merge, now it pushes it out. And it just did this automatically. This is now available on Netlify's global CDN. I didn't have to do any more. So I just, yeah, I just want to leave that with you. I had to take uh, take a moment to talk about that. Um, all right, yeah, so, so yeah, also, what do we I have questions wise? I highlight, uh, um, I am muted, am I muted? No, you're not muted, I can hear you. No. Okay, so uh, I also, to, just uh, to pile on with what you were just saying <laughs> about branching. Yes. One of the things people say is, well, I'm the only one using my repository, so why do I need to have branches? I just want to put everything on master. But what if you want to add two different features or a feature and a bug fix? And um, you just, if you pull the branches, you can sync them with master. You can push them back individually. And Git will help you out saying, oh, somebody actually already changed that line uh, in a previous push to master, yeah, what do you want to do about it? But being able to you know, keep that a little bit more modular is very useful, even when it's just you. Yeah, and uh, zero, zero chill or ooh chill or however you say that, um, where do you run the commands? I saw this question come up a couple times. So when you're in Git pod, right, um, you were automatically generated a terminal, um, but if you want to create another terminal, you can just say new terminal, and you just run them in the terminal, right? Um, the same thing with uh, if you're doing it locally, then, you know, whatever whatever terminal of your choice that you run, that's where you're going to run those wherever your application is. Um, and generally, you want to be running them in the battle text directory. I try to put this in the docs to make sure it was pointed out to ensure you're here. Um, that's where you're going to run the commands from. Uh, the other thing is a, a, a few people were having issues getting GitPod going. Yes, um, yes. And uh, so the other, so um, uh, apparently we have a big button that says running GitPod that doesn't work. Um, and also people are having trouble like creating the URL for GitPod, but you can go back to the base of your um, of your repository and click on the GitPod button. That'll work too. So Oh, yeah, um, if you've got the, that's right. If you have the, um, um, the extension that the Chrome or the Firefox extension installed, you'll see to what Kirsten is referring to. Actually, I'm using Safari, so. And you have the green get pop button? I do. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe they added it. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe but, they did. Um, yeah, usually for this, you need you know, to have the extension installed. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, uh, but thanks for the feedback that it yes. was confusing how yes. to uh, create your URL. Um, we'll we'll try to make that uh, an easier uh, task for you. Yeah, agreed. Totally agreed. Totally agreed. Okay. Oops, I just lost my place. <laughs> I'm over here. Here we go. All right. All right. Let me take a look. How are we doing on questions and everything? Now, one thing, uh, you know, if 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 for some reason um if you have an error in code or something like that and a function's not working properly we do offer the full game that has all the stuff um also uh there are solutions there are actually code solutions in each of the pieces um that you can use uh to see that the full working code i do see a couple of them here as i'm looking um lambda response was undefined check your function code again so i would say in a case like that i'm making a basis assumption uh tier um and i saw somebody else said i have the same tony t uh, over on youtube are you seeing that in netlify or are you seeing that locally that feels like you're seeing it in netlify if you are what you can do is you can actually notice what i'm doing right in netlify i'm going to functions and i can go to the deployment for my function and I can take a look at it. Um, if there are any logs for it or whatever, you'll you'll see those come up. Um, you know, if there's an issue, you might be able to see it come up, but we'll see if we can't help you guys figure those out. Yeah, I'm seeing, actually, I'm seeing a couple of folks with the Lambda responses undefined check your function code again. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm going to do here? Let's cheat. Here's the code. <laughs> Just, I don't know how well this is going to paste into YouTube, honestly. Uh, that might not be the best way to do it. And I will paste it over here in um, Discord as well. It should be that. 
Yeah, it looks like uh, one of the people who's getting that Lambda problem has exactly the same content. Interesting. Well, that's so um, might be a Netlify thing. I'm not I sure. don't know. That's that's an interesting one. That is an interesting one. Okay. Maybe. Um, oh, yes. I mean, we, Pietro's we, got it. I, we totally. Oh, right. Save. <laughs> don't forget to save. I have a feeling what's happening because the autosave isn't on by default. Save your code. Try again. <laughs> if you, unless you already did that. I'm so excited. I hope that's it. But um, yes, I have totally done that to myself. Save your code. That might very well be it. Yes. That's that's I'm I'm laughing internally. If you can't tell, I'm that's really that's a good great. one. And, and and we will and and thank you guys for for finding that. Yes, uh, um, we will definitely add to the instructions like a reminder. Yes. Uh, hey, don't forget to save. Um, yes, uh, because you know. All right, good. All right, so with that, let's give. I'll give everybody just another minute. I know that. Um, I also. Um, uh, Ariel, I also compulsively save. I am a, a control esser or on the Mac, a command esser like OCD. I'm with you on that one. That is, yeah. Yay, I'm seeing more people getting Hello World working now. <laughs> oh, that's great. No shame, people. Oh, that's this great. No, no, there's no shame, shame at all. Yeah. There's not at all. That was my fault. We should have said something. Um, so <laughs> I'm just going to warn everybody. The next quiz is coming up. I want to warn you. Quiz is coming up. All right, Pranav, I do see that. We're going to move on for now, and we'll try to we'll try to get it as we go into the next section, okay? Someone's got it. Uh, uh, Rashid, could you uh, post um, what, the, what the content of that, um, the, the content of your function? Yeah, that in? feels, that feels uh, like so something is off in that this. code with Rashid there. Yeah. Yeah. That. Okay, all right, so let's move on. Because uh, we do need to keep going. So let's go ahead and move on to our... Are you all ready for it? You know what's going to happen now. Quiz. <laughs> all right, I'll give everybody a moment to get in here this time. I promise I'm waiting. can't help but like bounce to this music is it just me or what oh thank you ryan yes here let me put the code up you're right you're right you're right the code is menti.com 912328 yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes yes maria it's totally doot 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 all right let's see all right i see more folks coming in all right, we'll give it just another moment here. And let's do it. How do you tell Netlify where to look for serverless functions in your code? Netlify.cfg, Netlify.env, Netlify.toml, Netlify fingers and toes. I think we actually have it configured in the Netflix, net, Netlify dot um, T-O-M-L file. Yeah, the right? TOML. Yep, it's the Netlify dot TOML. Um, and again, if you take a look at your base repository where you copy the code, you'll look, you'll see a Netlify TOML there, and that's where the configuration is. All right, let's see what happened in our leaderboard. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, hi, Ariel. I see Ariel's up there. And... All right, so H. Lysias uh, is still at top. Aiden one holding up in second place at Ariel number three. And Bessaran, nice job being the fastest, and you're really close. This is still a close game. By the way, we're going to have another question. So going into the next question. All right, and let's see what this one looks like. Deployment to production when pushing to master is... Automatic. Manual. You should really create a pull request first. No, really, create a pull request. <laughs> this one might be kind of mean, honestly, but we'll find out in a moment. <laughs> I think I will see. 
I may have been slightly mean in this, I'm sorry, because I can only imagine that some people thought that the answer was you should really create a pull request. But regardless, if you do or you don't, the push, the deployment to production and pushing master is still automatic, right? When you, when, when the code gets to master, it is in fact automatic. Um, so I am so sorry for those of you who were like, oh, he's being funny. I'm going to go for that one. And then you thought, you know, but you are correct though. You should really create a pull request first. Let's see what happened in our leaderboard. I wonder if this is going to completely change the board. <laughs> we just... Oh, Ariel got the fastest and takes top, takes the lead. Vivek in number two and H. Lysias in third. All right. All right. So good job, everybody. All right. So we're going to talk just a little bit about um, Stargate and Astra, right? We haven't really talked about it yet at this point. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next section here. And I will drop everybody the link. And we're only going to take a minute to talk about this. Okay, so the next section, what are Astra and Stargate? So we did talk a little bit about Astra already, right? Um, the one thing I didn't mention earlier was that Astra isn't just Cassandra a managed Cassandra in the cloud, but it's Astra and dev tools, right? It's got a whole set of dev tools that actually come with it. Now, part of this, you see this little Stargate icon. That's what that is. Um, Astra already provides the Stargate integration. This means you can have Cassandra with REST, GraphQL, and a document API. Um, there's a nice CQL console that you're going to use here very soon. Actually, you may have already done it. Um, there's a bulk loader. There's a data loader. Um, you know, so if you want to get in data, uh, you know, that is outside of it. There are methods that you can use to actually bulk load that data in. There's all sorts of ops tools that are there as well. Matter of fact, this DevOps API is really kind of cool. We've opened that up. Um, so you can talk to Astra programmatically. You're not just limited to the UI. There are metrics in there. The service broker, for those of you using Kubernetes, and if you want a way to be able to easily connect to Astra through Kubernetes, boom, that's a service broker, right? So all this stuff is being provided to you with the managed um with the managed Cassandra platform. I should also mention even though in the free tier you're limited to Google Cloud for now just because it's it's free and it's it's cheaper for us to run. That's all it comes down to. Um the other cloud providers AWS and Azure are in fact available as you go up into the other tiers. Um so there's there's a lot there that is separate from just a managed Cassandra. Um from the Stargate standpoint and I know Kirsten you're going to probably have more to say here. We've been talking about this a little bit. Really what this comes down to um, is this is now adding on these other APIs. Again, for those of you who are familiar with Cassandra, um, you would not expect that you can just talk to Cassandra through REST, through GraphQL, or through a document uh, API, but that is now available with Stargate. Stargate is its own open source project, right? Um, so it's Stargate IO, you'll see that here in the documentation. Um, and yes, we started at DataStax, but we open sourced it right off the bat because we want this to be part of the community. What's really cool is if you have an open source Cassandra deployment today, you can go ahead and you can actually put Stargate right, you can add it right now to your cluster, even in open source, um, and, and start getting this functionality, you know, right away. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of this diagram. Again, you can see here the various APIs, because CQL, by the way, is still there, that didn't go away. Um, but then it supports Cassandra 3, the upcoming 4, which is going to be released pretty soon, and then from DataStax Enterprise 6.8 and on, and of course, we provided you with a set of resources. The Stargate documentation link is giving a 404. No! Which one is doing that? That's, really? Uh, it looks like it's probably the first link under the um, under the logo. This one? Probably. Under the logo. Under the logo. Under the logo. Oh, this one. Oh, no. At the top. Oh, the no. Top. They, oh, my page top. changed. Oh, my bad. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I would say if you, I, I need to fix that, note, note taken, um, go down here and just go to stargate.io and that'll get you what you need. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. And then, uh, oh, go I ahead, just, I, yep. I just want to highlight one of the things you said. Yeah. Um, so, uh, there was a, a, a slightly snarky comment um, mm -hmm. from one of the attendees that said that we're using Cassandra because it's what we sell. Um, mm. but I want to point out that everything that you're doing here 
you can do yourself. You can yeah. uh, install Cassandra, Cassandra as open source. You can use Kubernetes to control uh, the nodes. You can you can put Stargate over over the top. Yeah, don't have to have anything to do with us. That's right. Um, so That's right. Um, these are projects that we're really proud of, um, and we're especially proud that we have them in the open source community. Yeah, and just to add to that, you know, I I totally get the sentiment. Um, you know, but outside of of Astra, if you know, if you look at what Datastax does, we've, we, you know, the the beginning of uh, Cassandra, um, you know, it came out of Facebook, but those people came and created Datastax and Datastax has been the company behind Cassandra for the last 11 years or something, right? So we first and foremost are here for Cassandra adoption, regardless of Astra, regardless of those other things. And, and as Kirsten said, um, all of that stuff, um, you know, pretty much, everything we've talked about, the Kubernetes stuff, the Stargate stuff, it's all open sourced, right? So our our goal is for Cassandra adoption and and for what's going on there, not so much trying to sell creds, if you will. All right, so with that, we're going to... To our next section here, and I forgot that I didn't have sound on there for a second. Oops, not that one. I meant the nice calming music. There we go. All right, let's. So we're going to go to lab four. Now, this is where we're going to start to set some of the. We're going to hook things up, is really what we're after here. Let me go ahead and drop these links for you. Okay, here you go. And here you go. There we go. So now, the next, what we're really going to do is for the next three sections. So you're going to see lab four, five, and six. That's what we're after. We're after lab four, five, and six. Just do them all in one shot, right? We're going to do them all in one shot. Um, so, and you'll find that they're, they're actually pretty short. Uh, so here, the key thing about these sections and what to understand is what's going on here is, okay, we've created our Git repository. We've hooked it up to Netlify. We've done a deployment, but we haven't hooked up any of the plumbing yet. We haven't hooked up our database. You know, we created the database, right? But we haven't hooked that up to our code. We haven't hooked that up to our CI CD pipeline. We haven't hooked that up to Netlify. These next three sections. So you're going to go from set environment variables in your application set this to set secrets in github to set environment variables in netlify you'll be done when you're done with this section set environment variables in netlify now we're going to hook up all the plumbing between these integrations and make it so we can start talking to our database wherever we deploy our app All right, with that, I will give you 20 minutes. So let's go ahead and get that going. There we go. Boop. I mean, boop. There it is. And again, I will do it with you. It's not there. Is that true? What's that? 
I, I changed my DD password. Yeah, I think once your uh, database was created, you could change it after the fact. There, uh, under settings. Oh, there's a... I could just be wrong. Maybe that was an old way and I'm out of date. <laughs> I'll take a look at it in a second. Oops. I think I missed a step. <laughs> yes, uh, the env.sh should be in your repository. Stated. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's strange. Uh, Igor in Discord does not have the env.sh, which is extremely strange. Did he maybe pull it from uh, Academy and not examples? That could be a thing. If you did, in f if you somehow got your repo from Datastax Academy beta battle stacks and not Datastax examples, that could be what's going on there. Um, here's what you can do, Igor. Of course, if that's the case, your code's not going to be up to date at all. But you could go and use this. Yeah, that's. I'll admit, I'm really, really thrown by that one. Hmm. Hmm. I can. I'll, I'll just paste you the code. That way you can move forward. Yeah, that's a really interesting one, Igor. Um, you can also do um, this from from uh, yeah. in case for some reason it's not seeing or uh, maybe we don't have the permission set correctly or yeah like that. I'm not sure mm -hmm. I, I'm just uh, that that works too yep ah uh, you have a different name for you. oh okay phew. <laughs> Okay, Whew. I was like, that one, that one had me going there. I guess we didn't get in the part to 
uh, delete the astro file, astro rc file. That we did. Mm. And it sounds like uh, um, Fox is uh, having some trouble with it. So. Mm. Yeah, because I edit, I'll, I'll look, but I'm pretty sure that got in it. Maybe, maybe I thought it didn't. I'm wrong. <laughs> Here, let me give me a second. Let's take a look. Yep, it's there. Oh, oh. Oh, did I not PR it back in? Oh, well, this is what happens when... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> So apparently I missed I missed a change. I missed a change. That is my fault. Well, hopefully not many people are running into that. Hmm. Could you run the um uh, are you have you run the first command? Oh, no, that's uh, I see. Well, well, we'll get to it in a sec.
Okay, one thing I think I should point out, because I am seeing some questions on it. Um, if you're at the end of lab four and you're filling out your .env file, right? So there's that script um, that should be in place, that env.shell. And if you run that, it's going to prompt you to paste in the data that you get from the connect tab. So in the instruction, if you follow that, you'll come here, it'll grab this. These are your database credentials, right? Then you run that script and it says, please paste the export block. You paste that in, hit enter. And it says, enter your database password. So I'm gonna battle password one. Now take a look at my ENV file. At this point, once I have that .env file, that's it, right? I'm done with that section. You don't need, uh, the HTTP pie thing is optional. You can just move on to the next piece. You're done here. This is what we need to hook up our app. You'll see where this comes into play in the next lab but this is where uh, we hook up our app to the database. So if you, again, if you got there, you're good to move on. If the password field is empty, you may have just not em entered it, Ashan. Um, so what I would do um, is just go ahead and run the script again and just paste in these values here. Make sure when you hit enter, you see please enter your password and enter that in. It should fill it out. Games Collection Roman is referring to the document that we're going to store in the database once we get to that part in the app. That's actually in the next section, so you'll see where that where that glue comes together, where that association of what is this for, that's where that'll come into play. Um, Pietro, uh, that's a great question. I want to take it um, live uh, because other people have the same question. Um, uh, we're using .env in a, a prototype. Um, uh, you can, of course, use environment variables that you see. Yep. Netlify and in GitHub. Um, you can have secrets for your database. This simply allows you to um, to work with uh this this system and i'm fairly certain that um that it's uh, react that's using that um and uh, i i'm sure they have other ways of setting your environment various goals as well so just think of this as a proof of concept um and of course in production uh you would want to use whatever your team's uh, um, processes are for uh, protecting secrets <laughs> How many games will fill a cap of five gig? Quite a few. You'll find that these documents don't take up very much space. So, yeah, that would be that would be a lot. <laughs> Donovan, um, do you have to create the games collection? So what's going to happen is this: in the next section, when we get to uh, when we move on to this implement a CRUD API, that's where the that's where the games document piece is going to come into play. So you're going to see in the code where you're going to hook that up. So. You know, since we've already stubbed it out, we know it's going to be there. That's why we're setting the environment for it now. But you're going to hook that up. The, you don't actually have to explicitly create it. You're going to do that in the code using the API, right? It's actually like really, really simple too. It's literally going to take a JSON blob and just store as a document. Um, so it, the API, the document API is going to do that for you. It's going to create the document in the database for you. Yeah, um, maybe we should, uh, are we uh, about um in good uh, a good place to kind of show and tell the HTTP pi stuff or do you want to wait a little bit yeah you know um you know i just realized something and i don't know i think i know how 
uh, we did this. I think the HTTP stuff is not going to work until we create uh, Battlesax Games, which doesn't uh, exist I yet. I actually found that it did. Um, oh. Let's give it a shot. Okay, I mean, let's he's not. Actually, he, the person who tried the HTTP command was actually trying the second HTTP command. So I'm not sure what was going on there. Okay. Um, so I figured we could go through it. And... Well, here, let me do it. Pew. All right. Now we know I, you know, so if you have Gitpod, this is already here. Uh, it won't hurt to put it there again. But like I said, I've already got it. Now I do know because I failed to add a piece of code that I should have, um, that I'm going to need to edit this. <laughs> well, let me just uh, take a quick moment to talk yeah. about why we have HTTP as a tool. Okay, yeah, so, please. Again, um, David has done a great job of describing uh, Stargate gives you different ways, uh, APIs, to access your database. One of the things that people have complained about with Cassandra in the past is that it's really kind of challenging to understand how to interact with it. So uh, we have a REST API, we have a GraphQL API, which is getting even better soon, and we have a Document API. And the Document API is just a... a it's like it's like MongoDB. So MongoDB stores things in collections, and they're JSON, and it uses the JSON to determine what to give you back. So um, what I've created. Oh yes, I see you have two defaults. You must have run it twice. I did, yeah, um, and I deleted the extra one, yeah. Um, so uh, so what we have given people uh, as examples are some curl um, commands. If you're familiar with curl, almost everybody is. The problem is that those commands can be very bulky. Um, it's hard to know which things you need to set. And um, it, it, it just puts a lot of friction on, on exploring the database. Um, HTTP is like curl, but it's really aimed at uh, API interaction. It's, it's uh, you know, you set some um, values in an RC file, um, and then uh, I wrote a plugin so that it could do the Astra authentication for you. So um, one of the things about the Astra authentication that's going to be improved soon is that we have our tokens expire um, after 30 minutes of activity, and so you have to go get another one. But so HTTP actually does that for you. It sees that your token has expired. It gets you another one. You didn't have to do anything. You just call that endpoint. So um, we have um, we have some uh, an example of walking through um, what we've got. So um, let's look at that first command, which is um, creating the document. It's over on the left. Oh yeah, I already grabbed it. <laughs> and I hope it works because I can't really see what the letters are on your screen. Um, that's um, there. Let's try that. Wow, very fuzzy. Yeah, that's I was. That's why I was thrown by this. Uh, the fact that it was saying that you must create the namespace first. Um, really? Okay. So uh, maybe I had created it uh, already. Yeah, I'm wondering that same thing. Uh, that's exactly what okay, I was well, thinking. Yeah. Why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, circle back to this after we do a couple of the other things? Okay. Let's and see. and uh, see what we can do with that. Okay. So, and we've got about 15 minutes left. I know that we want, yeah. So Samuel, I see it. Yes. About 15 minutes. Um, matter of fact, um, that is this, this piece here. Now there is a little bit more. We're running a little bit behind, but the good thing is once you get um, to this point, and you have the crud piece working, you'll see how everything works together. If you can't stay, that's totally good. I think we'll push a little bit past so we can actually push this to production, but that's gonna be the, the end piece is pushed into production. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and move forward into the next section. And we'll go ahead and set a timer real quick. Right. So I do want to be able to get through these, and then we'll do some of the quiz part to wrap up.
Yeah, Ruben, we'll, we'll pull out those questions again. Don't worry. <laughs> I want to make sure everybody can get to a happy path um, and get through the... Yeah, Gianluca, uh, what we're going to do is after this next section here, uh, right here, Lab 7, I believe the HTTP Pi stuff will work properly. I think we both realized, Kirsten and I, that uh, we may have had a database in, in place already when we tested it by accident, and so we kind of uh, threw off the order of things. We should have added this, the HTTP Pi part probably to the end of this section. So let's go ahead and do this one first, and we'll come back around. And I should point out, if you want to, right, you'll see this, this section right here at the very bottom of step 3A. It says for a full cold solution. If you open that up, it's got the whole thing. So you can just grab it if you, if you need to. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I think I see what I did. I I think I did a uh, cut and paste error. Hmm. Yep, yep, I, I okay, so. <laughs> oh, that's great. So I, I actually... I made a mistake in my own when I was cutting or copy pasting, uh, which I'm now going to fix. And I think from some of the errors that I'm seeing some from some other folks, I wonder if they did the same thing. I fat fingered that. So the key space, so the instructions that we have here are to go to the battle Battlestacks key space. I fat I personally fat fingered in Battlestacks DB by accident which is why from HTTP and other things, it's not working because I put the wrong key space name in. So something we should point out, um, if you want to verify this, for one, if you take a look, if you go to connect and you look here, you'll see this key space. See this? So if it's not Battlestacks, if it's something other than Battlestacks, you need to use that value instead, right? So if I go back to the HTTP Pi command we used earlier, and if instead of Battlestacks, I use Battlestacks DB, I have a feeling this is going to work just fine. There it goes. Yeah. Yeah. It's because I, I fat fingered the key space. So double check if you're running into that issue or if you ran into that, 
double check your key space name and again the instructions we set it up to be kind of homogenous for battle stacks but in fact if you're not using battle stacks you're using something else um, then you need to update that in the instructions and such I wonder if the game selection will get automatically created if um, you have the correct um, key space. Yes, that's exactly what happens. Yes, if you have the correct, if the if you didn't fat finger it like I did, right? When we created the um, uh, the key space in the database to begin with, the key space should have been battle stacks. So if that was correct, and mm -hmm. then you've you know, they, well, I'm just wondering if the HTTPI command would actually have worked because it was referring to a database, uh, a key space that you didn't have. Uh, yeah, it did work. That's what I did. I don't know if you saw me do it. I did it a moment ago. No. I, I put it to underscore DB and it worked just fine. Yeah. So that's what it was. It was just referring to a key space that didn't exist because I fat fingered it. Yeah. Oh, great job. Humung drunk or Humung Dirk. Sorry. Uh, hey, David, did you want to paste the um, the form to uh, Home and Drug Direct? So, yeah, I'll, um, I'll put it up because so, I know we are coming. Um, I know we're going to go a little over, but it sounds like some people probably need to go. So I will paste the form because all of you have stayed with us this time. It's only fair that you get the thing that uh, the, the nice little gift we're going to give you. So give me just a moment. I'll do that. Arial SQL CQL is the Cassandra um, query language. It's not C, It's not SQL. I mean, it's very confusing, but <laughs> it's not SQL. It's CQL. You know, funny and, enough, though, CQL is a subset of SQL. Um, yeah. So, um, but but you know, a lot of people uh, have found it uh, challenging to you know ramp up on CQL, uh, which is why we're offering these other ways to interact with your data. Oh, good. And I'm seeing more and more folks are getting up and running. So that's great. That's great. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do real quick. I'll, I'll paste this again at the end, but I just pasted a link for all of you. That link is going to bring you to this giveaway claim form, right? Um, what you can do is in order, here's the giveaway, right? You probably saw this in the, in the publication or the, the promotions for this. So we're going to give you one of two things. You can either get free vouchers to take your Apache Cassandra certification for free. That's two tries for free. Those are 145 bucks a piece right or you can get a 300 hundred dollar credit to use on astra now again we're using the free tier that is free forever that doesn't change but if at some point you decide that you want to like you know upgrade to one of the paid tiers then we'll give you 300 bucks um, and that is simply for coming here you've you've created your database so all you need to do the instructions will explain it but all you need to do is you come into uh your database here and you'll see you have the cluster ID. You just paste that in with the email you use to register today. And that'll be enough to get you one of those two things. Make sure you choose one option of what you want um, and submit it. And that's it. And that is something we're giving to you today for coming and spending time with us as well. Like I said, we're still not done. We're going to go a little bit further. I know some of you guys are invested in that swag quiz. Um, so we try, we try to really keep... Um, the voucher is valid for three months after the time you claim it, right? Um, so... Once you get once you get your voucher though, and you go to take your exam, if you pass, that's good forever, right? That certification is good forever, but the voucher is three months. Okay. Ah. All right. Let's see now. Let's see where did we end up getting to? Now at this point. And again, I'll say all that again later. I just want to make sure that folks have to leave. Uh, they do see that. So at this point, hopefully you are all to where you can run this last test. Um, and you run npm run test functions. And you see both insert game and, and hello world do their thing. The key thing, though, is that if insert game works, if that's hooked up properly, here's where you can really get it, right? Once I Every time I run this test, right, then it's going to create... 
a new entry in the database because each one of these is a new document. Let me fix this because I totally fat fingered it, right? And you'll see that all the tests that I'm running, I'm going to get those. Um, also, this ABCD that was from HTTP Pi, right? So you'll start to see this this interaction. You start to see that okay, my database credentials are correct because this is functioning and working. Oh, what's the extra ash to ash uh, in um, uh, YouTube? What's the extra three hundred dollars credits of Astra? So when you create a database in Astra, if I go back, if I add database, you see these other tiers, right? There's all sorts of other tiers in here um, where you can get a lot more compute and storage and such. This is where now you're starting to go away from the free tier, which is a little bit more throttle and controlled and going into the higher tiers where you can go all the way up to enterprise level workloads, right? Um, and that $300 for what, for the A5, I think that'll, that'll buy you like a month easy, right? Or more than that. I want to say it's actually the A10. Um, so this is now where you're starting to, you're starting to get into real clusters, right? The free tier is still a real Cassandra cluster, but it's very small and throttled. It's only meant for experimenting and doing quick development with. It's not meant to host your real application again. So that's really where the difference comes into play. All right. Um, as far as recommendations, you know, it really comes down to what are you trying to do? Um, if you are interested in getting a certification, and you want to be able to have that badge of honor, use that for potential jobs or whatever, then I would suggest going that route. Um, there's a shortage of Cassandra, people who have Cassandra knowledge, whether they're admins or developers on Cassandra. Um, there is plenty of Cassandra out there, uh, but the one thing we hear time and time again from so many of our clients and, and partners is that there are not enough people who know Cassandra well. So if, you, if that's interesting to you, go for the certification. Otherwise, if you think you could, if you, think that Astra might be something that you'd want to use and you want to up the level on it, then there's where the credits come into play. And either way, both both courses are are, uh, are free. So you yeah. can take them both and yeah, decide the, yeah. where you want certification in. So you'll still yeah. have the knowledge. Yeah, Ruben, as far as resources to study, um, if you choose the, uh, if you were to choose the certification route, let me go ahead and just get you something real fast. for those folks that are doing that. And then we're going to get back to the content because I want to make sure we finish this off. Here we go. So we do actually have a workshop that we do specifically on certification. There's the link. I just dropped it. There you go. Awesome. Good. And then you can take a look at the material in that in that repo that appoints you to all the resources you need for certification. Okay, so let's go ahead and see where we are on things. We could just quickly run through the HTTP stuff since that first one actually worked. Yeah, um, now that we know, yeah, now that we know that what it was, let's go ahead and do that while people are finishing up. Let me get to it. We'll just be, I'll just talk fast. Mm -hmm. As if I Here don't. Goes. Here we go. All right. Let me, and I just need to modify each of those commands. All right, go for it. Um, no, I was going to, you were going to do it and I yeah. was going to follow Okay. All right. So, um, so the first thing that he did, um, uh, can you up, up arrow to the HTTP uh, command that you ran? Oh, you're not seeing it, are you? Huh? Here, you go. here I got it right here. Oh. Okay. Um, and uh, you said you ran it and it worked. Yes. Let me do it again. It keeps putting a carriage return. All right, there we go. So helpful. There you go. All right. Um. So uh, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to uh, create a new document and you're going to you're going to name it. Now, um, if you look through the documentation for the document database, um, you'll find that you actually can have it assign a, 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 an ID for you, but um, that doesn't actually work out well. So that didn't look good. Is there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's try again. Um, that one, I have a successful run. Okay, good. So, um, so if you look, it, one of the things that I want you guys to know is that you can, in fact, um, put um, create a configuration file for HTTP, and you can just drop a question in uh, Discord later for, and I'll I'll talk to you about how to do that. But you can basically say, I always want to use Authy Astra, and I just want you to usually use the default section. Um, so. 
the next thing we're going to do, uh, you can actually run it with uh, verbosity turned up and it'll tell you more stuff. Um, and then let's check out retrieving it. So we're doing, um, you can see that this is um, the, the HTTP verbs. So put and post and, and get um, as you work through. So let's look at the get. Step 2C. David? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just hear... forget about the delay. Oh, <laughs> what, what do you need, Kirsten? No, uh, uh, go ahead and do that. The, the retrieve the document. I did. So they can see. Okay. And then um, what, um, what do we have? Um, and we can uh, see uh, the most recent game. Uh, if you just put um, games, the collection. Okay, done. Right, and um, you can actually say, uh, I want uh, uh, 10 games back from the database. So that's that last one uh, with the page size um, equals 10. Right, you can see all those games that we've created so far. Some came from my <laughs> test, some came from HTTP pi. Right. Uh, I know I don't have your your screen with me, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm talking to um, historical you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm in the past. Yes, All everything's right, relative. So, um, uh, and then you need to do the page size. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that's um, you must you must be way behind on that. Yeah, from the lag standpoint, because I do yeah. have that up right now. Okay, great. So anyways, um, this just shows you that uh, you're used to using something like curl to, to put things in your database, to grab things out of your database. It's a really fast way to test from anywhere if you don't happen to have a SQL, uh, a CQL uh, console available. Um, so uh, we, we put that out there for you guys to play with and enjoy. Uh, so uh, give it a shot and let us know what you think. All righty. All right. So what we're going to do, let's go ahead and get caught up. Um, I know that, uh, let's see, I saw a good amount of folks uh, did, in fact, get to the end test, right, where they are testing. Um, and if you've gotten to that point, um, then you're in good shape, right? This is looking real good because once you've got to the test here and you can run insert game, you know, and then you can verify that in the database, right? You know that it is, in fact, creating documents. So you know that you're you're probably set up pretty good there. Let's go ahead and move to uh, the next set of questions. Come back to some of those. All right, I'll give everybody a moment. This is again for the swag quiz. I'll give you a moment to get in here. And I'll put it back up on the screen just in case. Again, Menti code is 912328. What the? All right, and let's go ahead and do it. Start this quiz. What is Stargate? A new Mario game, a TV show. <laughs> A data API to give you REST GraphQL document on Cassandra. A gateway to the stars. I've realized I may have had the same answer in two places. Gateway to the stars. That's right. That's the funny answer anyway. All right. So funny enough, for those who answered a TV show, that is also correct. Because <laughs> it is. But yes, it is a data API to give you REST GraphQL and document APIs on Cassandra. And let's take a look at our leaderboard. see what this looks like and oh Beethoven was the fastest pulls into second Ariel still in the top and Vivek number three now what I'm going to do here is because we've already done lad seven because I was getting a, a little ahead let's go ahead into the next question since we're all in here and ready to go all right using Netlify serverless functions can be deployed locally and in the cloud maybe 
No? Yes? And let's see what happens. Yes is the correct answer. Yes, they can be. I like if you answered Schmaby, I wonder if you know what I'm referring to. I'd love to know in the chat if you uh, if you got that one. Um, but yes, the answer is in fact yes. Um, you can. That's actually one of the really cool features, as far as I'm concerned. Right? Is from especially from the development standpoint, when you configure those, the access is the same, regular regardless if you're local or if you're deployed. Um, so that makes you know finding them and knowing how to interact with them pretty seamless. Uh, no matter if you're you know just developing or if you're actually deployed. All right, let's see what our leaderboard looks like. Oh, look at that. HL, uh, H Lysis, Lysias, sorry, has, I, I'm so sorry I'm saying that wrong every time, has pulled back into third. Uh, Engin in second, and Ariel keeps the lead. All right, so we'll have one more question, but for now, this is the, this is the end right here, right? We're getting into the part where you get to deploy this application into production. So let's see, let's go ahead and do it. So we're gonna go to lab eight. We're gonna move on to the button here. And again, we do understand that if some of you have to drop off, this won't take too, too long, um, but that's why we dropped the form a little bit early for you. There you go. All right, so let's go ahead and set that timer. Let's get going. Because I, we, like I said, we do try to keep things on time here. We're just a little behind, so we appreciate you sticking around. There's the timer for 10 minutes. And this is, this is for all the noodles right here. Um, at this point, you're going to take all the stuff you've done. You're going to push that up. You're going to push it to production, and then you actually get to see it work. And one thing I want to point out right here, we do say it here, this section, you're going to go back. Don't forget you need, once you've pushed your changes up, you need to go back into your repository and PR those changes in or master is not going to, it's not going to do anything, right? Um, so that's what we're referring to here. Um, there is a reference back to lab two if you need it. But if you're familiar with how to do pull requests and everything, this should feel, again, this is kind of a process that you get used to. And so I'm pull requesting in the changes I just pushed.
By the way, if you're at this port, and I know you want to see your own code work, so that's part of why we have my branch. That's totally cool. Um, so if you commit your changes to my branch, I'm going to show you a little cheat, the super secret full game option at the very bottom. If you're getting stuck and you're like, is it my code? What's going on? My test passed, but something's not working. You could go to the super secret full game option. It's so secret, so super secret. And what you're going to essentially do is you're going to overwrite master with the full game, which is absolute working code, right? And when you do that, it will go ahead and deploy. And if that deployment works, you know it's something in code, right? And then you can always switch back to my branch. And what you essentially do is you reverse, you say git push um, dash F origin my branch master. If you want to then re overwrite master with my branch to get you back. But that is one way if you are kind of like not sure if it's the code or whatever, you could just use the full game. That's cheating, but you could do it that way. Well, and then once once you have a directory uh, that has uh, the full game, uh, you can actually do a diff, um, you know, yeah. with, with what you had, and figure out um, where the where the difference is. So it's very helpful that way too. Yay. We got people chomping at the bit for Minty. I know, right? <laughs> We're going to do it. We're going to do it. <laughs> We're so close. We only got a couple more minutes. We can do it. See how we're doing on the completions. Almost there, almost there. I mean, we still have 107 people watching, and um, and that's really fantastic. I mean, we're so excited that you guys stick with us, and um, and you get to play and uh, have fun with our stuff. So, Woohoo, Sean! Yay! Why, thank you, M4RI4. <laughs> so, she, Maria has been with us before in a, in a previous workshop, and when I saw her name, I think it pulled, I think she popped up on a, mem, on a menti, actually. And, um, uh, and I just didn't see the lead speak for Maria. I just didn't see it. So I was like, M4, RI4. And I, <laughs> so then we actually ended up talking after um, uh, we had connected out in Discord and we were chatting about some of the workshops and everything and then realized her name is Maria. Um, so now she's M4, RI4. Oh, it's okay, comms 52. You're, or I should say Mincrete. Yeah, you're right there. You're so close if you're on part seven. You know, the DJ... Tutsi, I've not been following. Um, I've not been following the particular issue you're having in CQL. But if you had any issue like I did, where I had by accident fat fingered my key space name, then the query that we gave you was for battle stack. So we're because that's we set this whole up so you're using that. And that's why we ask everybody to use those values. So if your key space per chance happens to be different, like what I did, you'll need to update that in order for it to work. So I don't know if that's what's happening, but I wonder. Yeah, let me, here, uh, Gianluca, I will drop the form again for you. Here you go. Because that form is important. And again, it is a thank you for coming here and spending time with us. There you go. All right, we're almost there, everybody.
Yeah, there, Ashutosh, uh, Tosh, and uh, YouTube. Totally right. Um, web development is his is a whole different ball game now than it was like in the 90s right <laughs> i mean who who here remembers if i could see some thumbs up days when you know if you were a web developer people just thought all you did was edit html files and that was it it has grown and expanded in its complexity um i would argue that the web development and the languages that are there is every bit as complex as anything i've ever done in c c plus plus you know, Java, whatever. Um, it's it's no longer. I don't I don't think it can any longer be classified as. Oh, that's not development I, for decades now, honestly. And and now with this kind of capability, right? The fact that from a front end development standpoint, you can go end to end with a deployment like this. I think I find that exciting. All right, so let's see. We are, okay, so the time there is up and I know we're over. So hopefully some of you have gotten to a point where you now have the front end here. If you say start new game, it'll generate a new code. If you then go up to your database and look, my code was GRVL and now nah, there it is, GRVL, wonderful. So now I know that up here, this is if you notice this is my this is my production URL, right? And if I take a look at my deploy, if I go back one here, this is that last PR that I pushed. This went to production, right? This is actually in production. So that means too um, that in my functions, my insert game serverless function is now functioning, right? This is actually a serverless, it's a microservice that's sitting out there uh, with an API that my code is using to interact with the database and do things. And all I had to do was drop it into a functions folder and, um, you know, export a handler. And here, boom, it's it's now available as a serverless function. I mean, that's just so cool. It is so cool. Um, so anyway, hopefully you got to that point. Now, you might notice, though, you can't do anything else. You saw me earlier go to a lobby. If you try to do that, it's not going to do anything. Why? Because at this point, we've only implemented part of the application. As I mentioned before, there is the super secret game option that is down here if you want to do that that'll give you the full game or you can play the whole thing and and play around with it plus you'll see the fully working code i mean this is all open source you can take this and do whatever you want with it um so have at it and have fun with that why don't we get into the last question because i know people were chomping at the bit as you mentioned <laughs> it would only be fair that we do that people want their swag right swag is important everybody wants a goodie everyone wants their swag all right so let's do it and all right one more time give everybody a moment to get in <laughs> what kind of back-end framework does jamstack require spring boot asp.net django this is a trick question why are you so mean <laughs> See who got this right. Yes, this is a trick question. Why are you so mean? It's totally a trick question. I'm a jerk. I know. Um, <laughs> Jamstack does not require a back-end framework. That's that's kind of the idea. That's the point. So yes, I was being a jerk there. Um, I'm glad to see most of you got that right. All right, let's see what our leaderboard looks like. other options were not anything we did anything with today. I, you know, I hope, <laughs> right, right. All right, so Ariel, congratulations. You got number one, and again, number two, and the person whose name I have now butchered like five times in a row, H. Uh, Lasias. Um, you'll have to tell me, this is like M, this is like Maria with M4RI4, really, this is the same thing. So maybe you can give me a phonetic spelling. But for the top three winners here, please, what I want you to do, we'll tell you here how to do this. Email Jack Fryer, Jack.Fryer, Jack dot fryer oops fryer at data stacks now this next part is important don't just email jack but take a picture take a screenshot of your win we need a screenshot of your win send it along over to jack fryer there and you will get your swag right now give you have to give jack a little time 
to um, to respond and everything. It does take a little time, you know, a couple days or whatever to, to process things and respond and all that. Um, but yes, send send an email to jack.fireddatedsex.com. Don't, again, take a picture of your win. Send that along to get your swag. And, oh yeah, SCAN, yes, seventh is close. That's absolutely right. Now, the relationship here doesn't need to be done today, right? Um, we are on Discord, we're in LinkedIn. Um, we're all over the place and we want you to come and, and you know, to come hit us up. If you have questions, if you follow up, I do know that some, some of you weren't able to get through all of the exercises and that's okay. Um, this is meant to be self-service. You know, by the way, since it's using all free tier stuff, it's all things that you can just delete and not have to worry about it. It's not, it's not a bad thing sometimes to just start over and go through the instructions again. Maybe there was something missed or whatever, um, but feel free to come reach out. We want to improve our workshops. We're always looking for feedback. Um, we're not perfect. So if you've got stuff that you found, I, you know, like one example would be that env.sh somehow, I have no idea how, but some of you didn't even have the file. I'm kind of lost on that one, um, but we'll have to figure it out, right? So with that, thank you everybody so much. And just to kind of like a final, summary of things. Just take stock of what you did today and what you can do with Jamstack. You just deployed a fully front stack app, right? And I'm just going to go over this stuff through a full CI CD pipeline with GitHub Actions using serverless functions. It's globally available through a CDN on Netlify and you're leveraging like the top NoSQL distributed database with a document API and Apache Cassandra. I mean, like there were all these things that all just happened and you all stayed with us and you did them with us together. So we really appreciate you coming on, your involvement and your attention today. Um, I hope you got something out of this and we hope to see you again in the future. And with that, Kirsten, any final words or? No, I, I, this was great. This was the, the first workshop where I got to be the color commentator. So that was Woo-hoo. excellent. Um, I, I learned that um, Skype sometimes wants you to reboot your computer. I, I, they're owned by Microsoft now, right? So, so that makes sense. Anyways, <laughs> um, uh, but you guys had great questions. You stayed right on it. Um, you know, you're, yeah. we're going to definitely, um, you know, take that feedback and make our instructions even better. Um, And I I do hope I see uh, some of you at one of our future workshops. Agreed. Absolutely. So with that, thank you, everybody. Again, uh, feel free to reach out to us outside of what we're doing here. Once the stream ends, the video will then show up. It'll it'll be there on YouTube so you can take a look at it again. Um, But if any of you guys have any troubles, come reach out. You know, we're, we're happy to help. With that, see you, everybody. Take care. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. And as always, don't forget to click that subscribe button and ring that bell to get notifications for all of our future upcoming workshops. Imagine a being gifted with powers from the goddess of Cassandra, who grew those powers until she could multiply at will, move with limitless speed, and unmask hidden knowledge. With those powers, she was able to fully understand the connectedness of the world. What she saw was a world in need of understanding. From that day forward, she sought to bestow her powers on all who came into contact with her, empowering them to achieve wondrous feats.